Hi, and welcome to the July 29, 2015 Plastic Surgery Journal Club. I'm Damian Marucci, this is Dr. Timothy Wang, who's the registrar at uh, St. Vincent's Hospital here in Sydney, where we are reporting from today. So the first paper we did was the surgical treatment of distal digit amputations. Success in digit, uh, distal digit replantation is not dependent upon venous anastomoses. This is from Taiwan, from a very recent PRS. So Tim, what did people think about this paper? I think most of our colleagues in this discussion itself found that this would be a very interesting paper. As you yep. can see, there's a common injury we see in the emergency of the department itself. And we agree with that uh, the findings of the paper itself shows that uh, doing digital distal, uh, digital replantation without a vein is actually very viable. In this case, they have shown 81% uh, survival rates both with an astomotic artery and a vein or versus a vein or uh, versus an artery by itself. So, but in general, well, there's a few comments I think most of the group pointed out in this yep. case. Um, I think in this case, they said that they heavily abraded the nail bed in this case, which is not something that we would generally do. Uh, no leeches were available at the unit and to the author in this case, something that we would probably do uh, use more often here at our centers here. Yep. And lastly, even the authors themselves point out that several pieces of data were actually missing uh, from the article itself, uh, such as the ischemic time was not accurately documented, and the tamai zones of injury in this case were also missing from most of the cases, so much so that these were not actually included. And also we made an interesting point from one of uh, the participants in this case, that uh, the children were included, that the age range of the study was from the age of 5 to 68, and we can both agree that composite grafting has a much higher rates of success in the child of age of 5 versus in someone who is the age of 50. Okay, so in a nutshell, you don't have to do the vein, but you do need to get the blood out some way. Uh, over here would use a leech. If you don't have a leech, you can remove the nail plate and do the heparin thing. Okay, the next paper we did, uh, the microvascular modifications to optimise the transverse upper gracilis or tug flap for breast reconstruction. This is from the Royal Martin in London, also from a very recent PRS. Um, so this paper looked at their experience and their uh, microsurgical modifications in terms of using the tug flap to reconstruct a breast and often they were needing uh, more than one flap, so bilateral flaps, to reconstruct one breast. And they spoke about uh, uh, performing separate microanastomoses for both flaps or anastomosing the microvascular from one flap onto the other flap and then um, onto the internal mammary artery and vein. So what do people think about this study? I think most of us agree that um, the little the technical points the authors pointed out in this study itself are very feasible and I think very valuable to us, especially to us uh, tra trainees when we first off started doing these flaps. They mentioned various ways and techniques in which you can maximize the pedicle length itself and the authors quite clearly stated that you know, if you do these small technical adjustments when raising the flap themselves that they, they had no difficulty with the length of the pedicle for most of the tongue flaps. And the stacked flap itself was something which was very interesting because um, the stack flap this, uh, was quite some novel which I've not read before in, of, in the, um, the literature and uh, it has been shown as very highly viable and in this case without sacrificing the thoracodorsal pedicle to be used as a lifeboat they were actually able to first anastomose one of the flaps to the internal mammary vessels and subsequently use the branch to one of the adductors and subsequently use that to link up a second flap onto that and they were able to achieve very reliable sizes and volumes without any rates of uh, flap failure. I mean the microsurgical proficiency of this group is phenomenal. They do a huge number of cases every year. I think it was something like uh, 250 or 300 a year, like a very high volume uh, uh, unit um, and uh, uh, the the technical expertise and the technical challenges this pose, poses is, is, is very great. Um, uh, some people would argue that doing two free flaps to reconstruct one breast, you know, might be a bit of a very long, long run for a short slide, um, but certainly their results were good. Interestingly, the only clinical photo they put, they put in the paper uh, was, was an adequate reconstruction, but I wouldn't, uh, you know, I'm sure you'd find a much better reconstruction uh, uh, some better before and after photos sort of out there. Okay, the third one we did was human adipose derived mesenchymal stromal cells may promote breast cancer progression and metastatic spread. This was a study out of uh, both Switzerland and the United States, I think, studied in uh, the current PRS. Uh, so this paper was basically using both an in vitro and in vivo murine model using human breast cancer cell lines um, 
uh, as well as human adipose derived mesenchymal stem cells and it showed that, that uh, um, adipose derived mesenchymal stem cells not only resulted in uh, the development of or the development of more serious breast cancers but actually uh, appeared to potentiate metastasis. Mm, I think we had a very uh, lively discussion regarding this paper itself. I think you have the breast and especially fat grafting for contour deficit in the breast has really taken on, have taken on a, a, a lot of um, uh, fans recently. However, looking at this paper itself, the main criticism is we were not sure whether the concentrations of both mesenchymal stromal cells within this article, as well as the concentration of breast cancer cell lines, was representative of those seen in a human patient and whether we weren't even sure of exactly what the concentration that we would normally see of mesenchymal stromal cell within an abdominal lipo aspirate in this case. So we're not sure if we could extrapolate the results of this study itself directly to the patient. Yeah. Yeah, a second deal, I think we mentioned quite clearly in this case that you know, most surgeons, uh, both the trainees here, agreed that we would have a little reservation of performing fat grafting, some of which have undergone a total mastectomy. However, this does raise a very interesting point in patients who have undergone a lumpectomy yeah. and for post-oncological contour deficits, where you could still be still be safe to use fat grafting. Yeah, and uh, there have been there are ongoing clinical trials uh, for the use of fat grafting for lumpectomy defects, and it'll be interesting to see whether uh, this paper is indicative or you know is predictive of uh, of further potential malignancies developing either in the same breast or potentially metastatic malignancies down the track. Okay, the final paper was the Cordillero paper from Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. What is the optimal timing of post mastectomy radiotherapy in two-stage prosthetic reconstruction, radiation to the tissue expander or the permanent implant? Uh, I can tell you now, uh, so in a nutshell, uh, what Cordillero reports was that there was uh, a greater, 30, greater than 30% predicted six year failure rate for irradiating the expander versus a predicted 16% failure rate for irradiating the implant. And we then had a very big discussion as to what that meant. Anyway, go on, Tim. <laughs> I think in this case it's a quite a long paper. You need to really stay focused to follow all the different groups and different arms of who's doing. Actually from the abstract itself, in summary the abstract is quite misleading. The abstract states that it's much more preferable to provide radiotherapy to a permanent implant. However, looking at the data which they've actually achieved that although there was a slightly higher rate uh, in this case of uh, failure of irradiating a tissue expander the results from the univariate analysis in this case were not statistically significant. At the 30 month, oh, the, 30 average, month the average average 30 month of time the frame. Study. However, if you extrapolate the data, they have found a significance between the groups at six years mark, but we believe that this, uh, this could potentially be slightly misleading and might not be um, as strong of a result as we initially showed. Well, it'll be interesting to see with time, but in a, but the other interesting thing was so uh, reconstructive failure is greater if you irradiate the expander. However, the cosmetic result is better, better. Uh, if you irradiate the expander. Okay, well, there were the four papers. For those of you who were there, I hope you enjoyed it. And for those of you watching now, thank you for listening.